right, guys. So what we're doing is we're trying to prevent some of that post revival chaos when it comes to child care, when it comes to the hours leading up to the first service. We're trying to prevent all that chaos with all the meetings and everything. Everybody's trying to get prepared and everybody's trying to have meetings right before. Um, so we're going to try this this time. Uh, to see how it works and and if this works then we can uh just continue to implement this from this point on so this is kind of a trial run but uh we're going to pre-record the child care training class and then everybody that's on schedule will be notified by the director to watch this class so for those of you that are watching live stream i will at some point in this class in this training class give you a keyword and when you've watched this class you must text me that keyword so that i can be assured in my heart that you have indeed watched this okay um starting off i just want to and i know most of you that have been working with the children's church you know this already it's nothing new but um i, I just feel like it's necessary to go over repetitively so that we really get it in our hearts um, the mission of what we're doing is to teach and empower kids for kingdom living by establishing the truth of their identity in christ empowering them to walk in kingdom authority through practical application and training them to operate in the power and supernatural manifestations of the holy spirit in their everyday life so with that mission in mind, I want you all to remember that this is not a babysitting job. This is not um, just one of those things that we just have to do out of obligation. I, I, I hope and pray that everybody that's working with the kids um, can pick up the heart that I have and that I know Miss Danielle has for these kids, that this truly is a ministry. And I want you to keep that in mind uh, as you see your name on the schedule, and and even if you've been in previous schedules, um, it's not, I don't want you to see this as a burden or just an obligation, but it really is an honor to be able to minister to these children. And um, our goal is to teach them and empower them to supersede us in every way, spiritually, naturally, as far as the ways of the kingdom, we want to take this seriously. So here's our commitments. Number one, we commit to take the children's ministry seriously and to teaching the full and uncompromised word of God in a way that is understandable and applicable to kids. Two, we commit not to giving the kids a weak or watered down version of the gospel, and we will not treat the kids as lesser Christians simply because of their age. We believe there is no such thing as a junior Holy Spirit. Three, we commit to be fair, compassionate, and dedicated to giving every kid the opportunity to have an encounter with the presence of God every time we meet for service. <clears throat> I just want to pause there. If we really take that seriously, that we're committing to giving every child an encounter a chance to encounter the presence of God. That means that we've got to take time ahead of, we've, we've got to prepare our hearts ahead of time. Just the way that you would if you were preaching in a main service or if you were um, doing a, a, a staff class or whatever it may be, you don't just walk in and just open class without any preparation. There's been prep, there's been prayer, there's been study, there's been... Um, intercession that's gone before so I, I hope and pray that we are doing that we're doing everything that we can to give these children an account uh, an opportunity to have an encounter with the presence of God as the leaders as the ministers of the children's ministry it's our privilege also our responsibility to create an environment where God's presence can freely move uh, number four, we commit to creating a safe and fun environment for the kids to learn and experience the reality of God's love and their position in his kingdom through worship, prayer, teaching, activation, and demonstration. Five, <clears throat> excuse me, we commit to always making room for the Holy Spirit to move, 
in our services. We believe the best way for the kids to learn how to operate and flow in the supernatural is by way of experience. So if you are leading a children's service and whether it be worship or whether it be prayer time or in the middle of the lesson or whatever, if you start feeling an unction from the Holy Spirit, I want you as the leader, I want you to obey that unction and, and follow the flow of the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid to go uh, off grid, if you will. And I'm not talking about crazy, uh, let's let the kids call the shots, but I'm talking about follow the Holy Spirit. You'll feel him leading you sometimes in ways that you hadn't expected on going. Um, let's see, I'm going to let Miss Danielle go over uh, how we want the lessons and the classes to kind of operate. I'm going to go over most of the logistics that we have heard many times before, but still necessary to repeat. Um, teachers I want and helpers, I want you to stay off your phones. The only reason you should be on your phone is if you're contacting me or Miss Danielle or Miss Ashley for help or something that you need pertaining to that to that class to that time um or if you're needing to contact a parent for some reason of course that's fine but as far as pulling up the the main service and live streaming the main service on your phone that's not okay you, if you really want to watch the adult service you can do that afterwards on your own time but not during the time that you're with the kids that time i want you to be focused and zeroed in and tuned in to what's going on in your classroom so stay off your phone um resist the urge even though uh a lot of us when we come from different centers we haven't seen each other in a while and we get excited and we want to hang out and catch up resist the urge to do that in your classroom um talking and and hanging out with each other as far as you know the other staff that can be done at another time when you're in the classroom i want you interacting with the kids the check-in procedure is still very much the same uh i want one thing that has changed is that i used to have child care workers i wanted you in the service 30 minutes prior to service I'm just going to add an extra 10 minutes to that and say, now I want you in there 40 minutes prior to service. And the reason for that is because usually at 30 minutes early, 30 minutes prior to the start of the service, parents are already lined up at the door. So if you're just showing up, you've not even put your purse down. Uh, you know, you've not even gathered your classroom supplies together. You've, you're, you're still kind of uh, discombobulated and unorganized. So, if you're on schedule, you need to be in that designated room um, 40 minutes prior to service time. The One of the teachers will be posted at the door, and you stay there until everybody's checked in. And you'll have a check-in sheet, and so each parent that's bringing their kid, you'll need to put the the date, the parent's name, the child's name, ask if there's any allergies, let them know that we do serve snacks, so make sure there's no allergies or any um, special diet preferences. I know some parents are trying to keep their kids away from like red dyes and stuff, so um, just ask if there's anything that they do not want their children to have. And then get the parent's contact information, okay? That needs to be done. Now, at the end of the service, that same person that did the check-in needs to, again, take that post at the front, at the door, the entrance to the classroom, and that person visually needs to make sure that each child leaves with their family. Um, we don't want to be lax in this area, especially when you're dealing with the youngers, because sometimes when it comes to the end of the service, they're so excited, they're ready to leave, that when they see their friends leaving, they go ahead and make a dart for the door, and then we've got children running around, <laughs> running around the sanctuary, which is not good. Okay. Um, I have instituted <clears throat> a few disciplinary policies. When... Um, when you get all your curriculum and you get your sign-in sheets and everything, you will also receive a copy of these policies, but I want to go over them just to be safe, just 
so that I can verbally explain them to you. Um, these disciplinary policies apply to every child that is two years or older, okay? And there's three possible scenarios that um, I have on here. And the first scenario, number one, is a disruptive child who will not follow instructions and is creating a distraction for the other kids. Under each scenario, I have steps, starting with one and then going up from there. And I want you to follow these steps in order. And often, as you're following these steps of correction in order, it won't be necessary to get all the way to the highest level. But if you do, um, I want you to follow these to the T, okay? For, so scenario one, for a disruptive child, say you've got a child that's talking, keeps getting up, keeps running around, uh, keeps pulling other kids from the lesson or from worship into whatever they're doing, then this, this is the steps you would follow for that child. First, the teacher or helper will openly ask the child, please, please sit down, please stop interrupting. A lot of times, especially with older kids, uh, this is effective, just this one step here, because they don't, they don't really like to be called out. But if it's a classroom setting and they're already disruptive, they're already drawing attention, every other kid is already looking at the distraction, that's where I feel that it's okay to say, uh, you know what, Billy, hopefully there's no Billies. Uh, I, I, really, I, I really want you, need you to sit down and listen because you're, you're keeping other people, uh, other people are getting distracted or whatever. So you just ask them uh, to sit down, please stop interrupting. If that doesn't work, step two, the child is made to move seats and to sit next to the helper until they can calm down. All right. This is where um, one person needs to be leading the lesson. One person needs to be leading um, the service, if you will. And the helper, whether there's one or two, need to be in the back of the room, kind of watching and observing the children and um and a helper really should be able to notice if there's a kid that's being disruptive or a kid that maybe needs to switch seats. And a lot of times the helper can just step in and get that done quietly. And the person that's teaching the lesson can just carry on with the lesson. Okay. So step two, child is made to move seats and sit next to the helper until they can calm down. If that doesn't work, Step three, the helper pulls the child to the side and speaks with them one-on-one -on -one about their behavior and its possible consequence. For example, now listen here. <laughs> Not, don't say that. That's what I say to my kids. <laughs> now listen here, girl. Uh, for example, I really need you to sit down and listen and pay attention to what Miss Danielle is teaching. And if you can't do that, I'm going to have to call your mom to come get you. So you, you explain to them what you need them to do, and then you also explain the consequence of what's going to happen if they don't uh, do what you need them to do. Now, that, needs to ha that conversation needs to happen one time. If you, are, if you warn children several times, I'm going to call your mom, listen, I'm going to call your mom, it really is having no effect whatsoever. So I want you to have that conversation one time, especially with the olders, because they you understand that they they know what you're saying. They know what you're, um, uh, they they understand what's expected of them. So, um, you explain to them the consequences, and. Hopefully at that point when the threat of being removed from classroom is presented to them, they'll settle down and they'll, they'll uh, listen and follow instructions. Even if they settle down, they fall into line. I still want you at the time of pickup to notify the parents. And, and this is not a special call or special text. It's just when they show up to get their kids, just say, Hey, just wanted to let you know it's not a big deal, but we had this little issue with Billy. Um, he was, you know, kind of disruptive and, and we had to, we had to switch him seats and pull him aside, but he, he did settle down after a while, but just kind of let them know what's happening. Um, so if they want to do any, have any further talk when they get home with their kid, that's up to them. But it, if you, if we kind of keep the parents in the loop about what's happening with their kids, they're not going to be so shocked 
if the next service Billy uh, has to be they have to ca be called to get Billy because he won't listen they won't be so shocked because they know it's already been an issue so um, and I think this kind of helps us build good relationship with the parents as well and but if that doesn't work if the pulling to the side and having that conversation with the kid doesn't work then step four is this notify the parents to come get their child so you will send them a text and let them know. Look, we 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 tried moving him seats. We've we've warned him. Uh, uh we've warned him, and we let him know that if he didn't stop, we was going to call you. And you know, still is kind of causing a distraction where the other kids are not able to learn. However, he can come back the next service. So you know, <clears throat> have that conversation with the parents. Now, if you send a text to the parents and they don't answer, it's probably because uh, they're in service and. Um, they don't want to get in trouble by having their phones out. <laughs> so if you do text a parent to come get their child and the parent is not responding, then what you need to do is to text me or to text Ashley Nocan, and I'm going to give you our phone numbers because um, I try to keep a, a little bit of an eye on my phone, especially during revival services, just in case I am needed for um, child care. So my number is 865-456-4413. And um, this is sad, but I'm having to look up Ashley's number because... <laughs> My phone has made me so stinking lazy. And Ashley Nakan's number is 865-456-2216. Oh, I should have known that, but it is what it is. Okay, so scenario number two is this. A child who is behaving aggressively, threatening, or acting or speaking inappropriately towards others. Okay? And you notice this is a whole nother procedure of dealing with things versus a kid that's just being hyper and causing a distraction. Okay? That we're talking about a kid that is pushing uh, or, or even just uh, kind of bullying type of behavior or um, kind of threatening in their voice. And that, that would apply to students or uh, the teachers as well. So for step one, the helper pulls the child to the side and speaks with them one-on-one -on -one about their behavior and the consequence, basically saying, uh, I need you to calm down and stop doing this specific thing. So this is the specific things that you need that child to stop doing, or your parents are going to have to come get you. Do you understand? Make sure they understand. If it happens again, uh, then the next step is notify the parents to come get them. So you notice with this, because it's in the behavior is increased in intensity because we're not dealing with a disruptive child. We're dealing with somebody that's bullying or, or acting aggressively towards others. Um, we, there's a lot less steps we have. We've got to go through first. We warn them. And if that doesn't work, we notify the parents. Now, scenario three only has one step. Scenario three is a child who has caused harm. So we're talking about a child who has pushed, kicked, kicked, bit, uh, caused harm in any way to another child or to themselves. There's only one step. We don't warn them. We don't say, hey, don't you, don't you bite again. Don't you push again. Because we're dealing with a lot of kids and we want everybody's kids to be safe. When there is a child who has caused harm in some way to another child, to a teacher or to themselves, we just notify the parents immediately. Um, if that is the case, you've, you, when you notify the parents, the child must stay with the helper or with the teacher until the parents arrive and can't ming mingle with the other kids. Um, because we don't want to, if somebody has gotten hurt, another kid has been hurt, we don't want to take the chance of it happening again. So we keep the, the, the kid that's uh, caused, caused the harm. We keep them with us until the parents arrive. We keep them next to us. When the parents show up, you've got to inform them of the details and also inform them that because it was a situation where it has caused harm to somebody else, 
that you have to report it to me and then I have to evaluate whether or not that child can return the next service or whether they whether they may not. And that all depends on the severity of the situation. OK, now the parent of the injured child, let's say a, a one kid bit another kid when if they need first aid, they need an ice pack or whatever, obviously give that. But when the parents come to pick up that in the child that got injured or bitten, whatever, um, you want to let them know like, hey, this we had a little incident um, and he was bitten by another kid or hit or what scratched, whatever. Uh, and I just want you to know, we did ha have the parents remove that kid from class and we, you know, we're looking into it just kind of reassure them that we were aware that there was an incident and that we took action in the incident and, um, that we're doing everything in our power to protect their kids. Cause we, we do want parents to have the reassurance. I know most parents are understanding that when you get a group of kids together, stuff happens and that's fine, but I think parents want the comfortability of knowing, like, if something does happen, action is going to be taken to protect my child, okay? And then quickly, I'm going to go over the sick and injury policy, and then I'm going to have Miss Danielle come up and explain the lessons. <clears throat> the sick and injury policy applies to every group, from the babies on up to the oldest age, which is 12, uh, any child exhibiting the following symptoms will not be allowed into the nursery or into children's church. An active fever or a fever in the last 24 hours without medication. Green runny nose, blistering rashes on hands, feet, face, or bottom, like diaper area. Uh, vomiting within the last 24 hours. Diarrhea or pink eye symptoms. If any child shows up to be checked in and they appear to have any of those symptoms, you've just got to kindly uh, let the parents know that you're under obligation to me to not bring that child in because we don't want we don't want to expose any other kids. Um, and again, just refer you can always refer it to, hey, this is not me making the decision. This is the policy. Pastor Mills wrote this policy and she's kind of holding our feet to the fire on it. Um, now, if a child who's already been checked in and they're all say is halfway through the service or whatever, and they start to develop any of those symptoms, the the fever, the vomiting, the diarrhea pink eye, you know, all those different things. If you start to notice them after the child's been checked in, you've got to notify the parents to come get them at that time, not at the end of the service. And then the helper, and this is again, our helpers are, helpers are so important. And the helper must thoroughly clean and disinfect any areas that may be affected. And the smaller the kid is, the younger they are, the more areas that are areas that are probably going to have to be disinfected because babies like to put everything in their mouths, as we all know. Okay. The injury po policy also applies to every age group. And it's pretty basic. If a minor injury is sustained, you know, a little bump, scrape, bruise, uh, you know, something minor, apply ice, pa ice pack or Band-Aid if needed. And then when parents show up, notify them of the injury and the details. Um, I know me as a parent, and I think probably any parent is this way. I don't like picking up my kids from daycare or any other thing. I don't like picking them up when they've been with somebody else and seeing mystery knots on their heads or marks on their body. And, and nobody explained to me where, where that came from. Now, if I pick them up and she, and they've got a knot on their head and somebody says, well, uh, they were running and so they crashed into another kid. Okay, well, I can understand that because I see them do that kind of stuff all the time. But um, notify the parents of the injury when they arrive. If a major injury is su sustained, a major injury um, to me is something more than just a little bump, scrape, or bruise. Apply first aid as needed and notify parents immediately. So, um, we do what we can in that moment, whether it's an ice pack or a compress, if there's bleeding to stop, to, to, uh, kind of 
do what we can in the moment. But the parents need to be mo- notified immediately. Parents come to the to the classroom and the parents look look at their kid, look at the situation, and the parents can make the deter- determination whether or not hey, I need to pull my child out of here. I've got to take him to the emergency room or you know what? This is just a little scrape. He does this all the time. He's fine. So either way, if you have any question on an injury, if you think it's, you're not sure if it's a minor or a major issue, the best way of safety to cover our own rear ends is just to notify the parents and have them come and look and make the evaluation on whether or not they think their kid needs, needs uh, to be pulled out and get medical attention or not. When there's a major incident, <clears throat> major injury, um, another very important thing I need everybody to be on top of is make sure we're filling out incident reports detailing the injury and also, just as important, detailing what we did to resolve the situation, what what action we took. Okay, I think I've covered everything. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Miss Danielle. You want me to move this chair out of the way? Okay, so um, I'm just going to go over a little bit of the curriculum. Um, So I like how she said to show up 40 minutes early this time because we can also be able to look over the lesson without just doing it right when it's time to do it. Okay, so um, let's see. I'll be having everything laid out like this. We got activity one, activity two, and activity three here with a scripture memory that needs to be posted up so they can actually see it and memorize it as you're going over the lesson. And that'll be for the seven to 12. Right here in each box will be the lesson and all the supplies that go for that lesson inside of each tote. And it should be pretty prepared for you guys. And prior to this, my apologies, I haven't been getting there early enough to do this. But okay, so first off, um, we're going to pray in and it's very helpful to get like a volunteer to help pray in, um, get a volunteer from one of the, the children. They like to participate Helpers are always good for going through the lessons. And like she was saying about the the ones who like to get rowdy and things like that, I've noticed if you get their help, say, hey, can you be my helper? They kind of calm down. They want to participate. They want to learn. They want to help the others learn too. Um, So first off, pray in and then do at least three songs of worship. And you can also get some of their advice, what they like to listen to, what worship music's, because I know they always are throwing music options out there. And I'm going to do my best to work on getting Bluetooth speakers so that they have something to actually worship with. Um, But so this is all to just set the atmosphere so that the children can actually be have their hearts postured in the right way. Okay, so I got a little ahead of myself. Um, the 7 to 12 will be act three activities, and so each activity needs to be at least 20 minutes. No less than that, because we have a time range that we need to cover, and we also want to thoroughly express what we're trying to get across here. Be sure that all students are participating, and don't let them just sit aside alone. If you see a student or a, ch- a child sitting to the side by themselves, just... Um, ask them to be your helper or just get them participating in it because we want every one of the children to learn something and have an impact off of whatever there is to offer. After each activity, After the third one, there's going to be a prize bucket. And if they see that sitting up there, it kind of gives them an incentive to want to participate and want to listen. Because if you tell them ahead of time, like, hey, we're going to ask questions afterwards and I need everybody to pay attention, they can just pick out of here afterwards. And also after memorizing and quoting the scripture, they can pick a bigger prize that's in there because there's toys and there's candy, there's different things. It just gives them an incentive to want to participate a little bit more and pay attention. So get feedback from them after each after the lessons are are done because it's important that they actually did get something. So whether it's just the 
the quoting the scripture or explaining what it means, if they get, if you get feedback, it's, um, it just proves that the children were listening and they were understanding what you were trying to get across. If you don't know how to express it, the Holy Spirit will teach you how to teach. Uh, I struggle with this all the time and I'm just like, God, help me. And the Holy Spirit instantly comes in and speaks through me. I'm, I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> Uh, um, and then, so try your best to keep all students calm as possible. Sometimes it's a li they're excited. Um, that This is for the 7 to 12-year-olds. Have them to raise their hands um, when answering the questions so that we can keep some kind of order in the classrooms. Um, no yelling, no um, speaking out of turn. Um, so we want to keep it to where the children that do want to learn something have a fair chance at, at actually learning something. So for the ages three to six, it'll be the same, pretty much the same little totes, but it'll have something written different on the front of them. It's gonna have lesson, craft, and game. The reason for that is because the three to six year olds are harder to keep their attention. So we've just set it out a little bit different. Um, the lessons, like I said, for these, they're gonna be at least 20 minutes each. It's very important that we um, enforce that because they need to get that time in. Okay, so for the three to six, the lesson will be at 15 minutes because they are three to six year olds. They're not gonna pay attention to what you're doing very long. Um, now the craft is still 20 minutes and the games are still 20 minutes for the three to six year olds. Um, let's see here. And it's the same for the three to six year olds. You always want to pray in and worship. Um, it's set in the atmosphere. Um, so let me move this stuff out of the way. So the morning services, we will have a lesson, but for the night services, we have crafts, games, just extra little things here. It's no, there's no lesson to go with it, but you still want to enforce the scripture that they learned the night before. It's the focus scripture. And you can still just set that up so they can see it. Um, each, each one of these, so there's a game in this one. There's a craft here with a canvas that they'll be painting. And like I said, you still want to focus on the scripture from the night before. Um, working with the three to six year olds, you want to, um, as you're going through each lesson or each little task that we have, you want to, um, I've seen that it's healthy to like announce it to them like, hey, we got five minutes left of this and then we're gonna do something different. We're gonna start on our craft after we finish this. So I've seen that it, it, it helps with the three to six year olds because they, their hearts are prepared to shift to, into something different instead of running off like, hey, we're about to do a craft, we're about to paint, we're about to color. So um, that's always healthy for that. Um, let's see here. And on, I'm going back and forth, I'm sorry. Um, on, the, on the mornings with just the games and the crafts and things that we have, be sure that everybody's participating. Don't let them choose if they wanna do it or if they want, don't wanna do it. They need to participate so that we don't have kids in different spots and trying to you know, round them up every five minutes. Um, The main thing is to just have fun. Just have fun with the kids and have fun getting the lesson across and uh, enforcing the, the lesson, doing your best to get the lesson across. But that's about all that I have right there. Just make sure that you're following the times and the curriculum. Okay, so what we're going to do, you guys, is that after this class gets uploaded, um, we're going to notify your directors, and if you're on schedule <clears throat> to be in the children's ministry, you're going to ha have to watch this class. 
Um, and I'll know that you've watched this class when you text me this word after you've watched the class. And the key word is, I'm trying to think of something that they're not going to think of. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to think of one of my favorite basketball players right now, Trey Young. So, Atlanta Hawks. So, <laughs> when you've watched this class, send me that message that says Trey Young, because there's no other way that you would ever think to text me that unless you have legitimately watched this class. So, um, I just... I hope this works and we can continue doing this instead of having that meeting uh, a few minutes prior to service. But we're just going to see how this goes. I'm just going to pray us out. God, thank you so much for these men and women who have uh, volunteered their time and their energy and their giftings to sowing into the children. God, I, th I know that your heart is for this. And I know that your anointing will will rest on them, God. And so I just pray that everyone that, that does this, God, that they really take a delight in doing it, Lord, that they, they take delight in ministering your word to these kids. And whatever the age group, God, I just pray that, it, that ever, over every age group, there would be safety, there would be uh, fun, and that there would be anointing over every age group, Lord. We just come against any opposition of the enemy. We just pray, pray the blood of Jesus over all of these classrooms that we're going to have, Lord God. We just declare that by the power of your blood, Lord, there will be no incidents or accidents, Lord God, but that your word will go into the hearts of these children, Lord, and that, and that, and that when the kids leave at the end of the service, they'll feel loved, they'll feel, uh, they, they'll feel uh, edified, and they'll feel strengthened in their spirits. And I just thank you, Lord, for the men and women that are serving in children's ministry to make this possible. So I bless them right now in the name of Jesus. Amen.